Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Andy Heining of Fraunhofer IIS EAS. I'm going to talk today about efficient electronics. Andy, obviously we've heard about efficient electronics for a long time. What does it really mean? Yeah, from our perspective, it means uh, we have to reduce the power consumption of all the electronics what we see in the market, meaning from um, microprocessors up to uh, uh, power electronics. This is not just about power efficiency, it's also about energy efficiency, right? Yeah, that's, uh, it's power and energy efficiency, so it means we have to provide more compute power, more uh, power on, on other components at the same power uh, consumption or on the reduced power consumption. Let's take a closer look. Okay. We've been cruising on Moore's Law for a long time where just throwing more transistors at a problem typically was a way that people solved it, but we've run out of that ability to do that. So now we have to do things a little bit differently or quite a bit differently. And some of that involves sparser algorithms, uh, more compute per cycle. What are you seeing in terms of efficient electronics, in terms of the challenges there? And then also, what are some of the solutions? Yeah, for sure. What we definitely see, it's not only to pack more transistors into a system. Uh, we see that we have to adapt the algorithms much more to the hardware. So we need much more hardware software code optimization in the future uh, to have better power efficient systems. And we've been talking about that for decades, right? It's just why is it finally happening now? Uh, the reason that it's happening now comes from two perspectives. So on the one side, we see that the energy is going much more expensive in, over the last years. And on the other side, um, the compute power that we have to pack into the system, it's that expensive that it's very, very difficult to get this uh, power in into the system. And that means we have to reduce the power consumption now. And this is only possible by such hardware software co-optimization. And this becomes even more important as we get into things like generative AI, because the amount of compute that needs to be done and the amount of data that needs to be processed is exploding, right? Yes, for sure. That's exactly the driver for that. Uh, we see that we need that much compute power that it's more or less impossible to build such system in the future. And this is the starting point um, to, uh, to build new algorithms, new concepts with hardware software co-design. What are we looking at here? Yes, so this is the current approach where we have only one SOC and currently all the functionality is inside of this SOC and it's a very uh, it's a general purpose processor that can do on software this functionality. But in the future we will see that we have to disaggregate uh, the functionality into different chips. They are much more focused to, to do that much more power efficient. This becomes a whole different problem. As you disaggregate this SOC, now you have these partitioning problems over distance potentially that you didn't have before, right? Yes, right. So we definitely have new problems with the disaggregation. We have to find functionality that makes sense to disaggregate. Um, it must be a functionality that is often reused or where we really need power efficiency um, to that the whole system approach makes, makes sense. Do the tools exist to make this uh, fairly simple? Uh, we've been hearing a lot from the EDA vendors that they're pushing in this direction, but in terms of practical usage of this, do, are the tools there and are they easily uh, adaptable from where people are today? Um, yeah, and on certain points, the tools are available, but if we really come from the system level, from the partitioning on system level into up to the transistor level, we see currently gaps in the flow. So as you start disaggregating this SOC into multiple parts, you're now dealing with the idea that, oh, if we can disaggregate this, now we can add in more features than we had before because we, we were reticle constrained before. What sort of problems does this introduce? Yeah, in general, that's totally right. We can do that. But on the other side, we have here the economical problem. Uh, all these chips where we want to disaggregate in um, must be designed or must, must be manufactured in new nodes. That means on the other side, we have high uh, development costs and that also means we have, have to find functionality that is often reused so that it really econo makes sense from the economic, economical side to do that. And that efficiency that you're talking about also brings in that element that you're just talking about there, which is price too, right? Because it has to be done in an, both an efficient but also a cost-effective way. Yes, exactly. So we need here, we have to consider always the price. We have we have to have in mind that we have to develop it on the right uh, price perspective. Which markets are the, are you targeting for this? 
Yeah, currently we see here, especially the data center market, where we definitely see that we need such approaches because here it also makes sense to, to disaggregate it uh, because here we see the most compute power that is necessary. One of the trade-offs here is as you get more efficient, you also potentially shorten the lifespan of some of these chips too, right? Uh, yeah, it can happen. Yes, uh, if we have a, a very specific uh, chip with a specific architecture, then it's, it's extremely utilized. And then some of the transistors are used always, are always on, and that can uh, reduce the, the, the lifetime of such products. So how do you deal with that? Is it a matter of adding in enough margin so that you can uh, reroute signals as needed? Uh, currently, we see that we can solve it only on the on the simulation side. We, we build new simulation models, more accurate simulation models, to really uh, uh, figure out what is uh, what is done or what is happens during the life cycle of the product. As you started getting these these better models and you're looking at how to improve efficiency, are there things that you found that you didn't see before? Yeah, what we see is that uh, a lot of models overestimate up to now the uh, the reliability aspects, um, and we see that we need much more. Uh, that's the reason why we need much more accurate accurate models, because otherwise the expected lifetime is too short. And the old way of just doing things or throwing margin at this don't work anymore, right? Yeah, uh, if we do too much margin into the system, then we have the the, the efficiency problem again. So. Uh, with more margin, we reduce the efficiency. A lot of the, the concern about efficiency really started with things that were tied to a battery, but now it's moved into a lot of different areas, right? Yes, for sure. Uh, so efficiency is not only on the SOC side, so we have also the power delivery uh, for such complex systems, and we can also save a lot of energy on the power delivery themselves. And so this puts a lot more emphasis on really getting the design right, as opposed to in the past where you're just churning out something that says, okay, we can use whatever's available, right? Yes, exactly. So what we need here is more adaption on the power delivery concepts directly to the SOC concept. So, but we are, here we have a little bit the problem that everybody wants to have uh, standard interfaces, and that makes it uh, more difficult to have a, a highly efficient, highly uh, optimized solution. And so looking at your diagram there with the accelerators, what you're really trying to get to is very customized approaches because that's really where you gain some of your efficiency, right? That sort of flies in the face of what you're talking about with standards. Yes, that's true. So we, we really need uh, highly efficient components. And here it's, uh, it's a compromise between uh, highly optimized and standardized. So that is a compromise between both aspects. You've got two conflicting goals here, one of which is you're trying to get to more standards. The second one is you're trying to get to more domain specificity because what you're doing here is, is with these different accelerators that you've drawn on the board, those are going to be very specific for very, uh, very specific uses. How do you marry those two? You've got a, a lot of trade-offs here. Yeah, exactly. That is the big problem here on this on this uh, disaggregation concept. Um, on the one side, we everybody wants to have standards, but on the other side, if you want to have the best uh, power efficiency, you have to optimize it for your application, and then you are out of a standard. Then you also don't get those economies of scale too that you were getting before, right? That's right, and this was uh, this is related to, to your question before. Uh, we can only do that if we have very efficient uh, design flows, uh, development flows, where we can easily derive the accelerators from a high-level description. This sounds like it's going to be a, a concern for most design teams going forward, right? Yeah, that's currently really a problem. Andy Heinig, thanks for a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much.